you've heard everything from Mark. He's told you what he thinks. You know how much he likes it. Uh, well, now we can speak to St. Maud herself. That is Morvith Clark, who joins us from somewhere, I think, in New Zealand. Hello, Morvith. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Oh, it was very nice to, to speak to you. Where are you? Um, I'm in, yes, in the North Island in New Zealand, in Auckland. So it's 5.30 a.m. <laughs> so hopefully oh. I'll make sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, we appreciate we appreciate you speaking to us. Thank thank you very much indeed. Can I ask what you're doing? What what are you doing there? Um, I'm filming a project called Lord of the Rings, um, but that is as far as I can go. <laughs> I'm right. I've, I've, I've I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, as that's as far as you can go, let's consider that uh, a red line in the sand. So that's why you're there. Okay. Well, now listen. We've been we've been talking about St. Maud for a couple of weeks. I know you know that Mark absolutely loves it. But before I allow him into the conversation to gush, um, for uh, folk who haven't seen it, just introduce us to the character of St. Maud. Tell us who you are and where you are with this film. Um. So I play the character of Maud, who is um, a nurse, a palliative care nurse, and she becomes convinced that she has to save the soul of the person who she's looking after. And um, she does that with a huge amount of conviction. <laughs> okay, well, that's certainly one way of, uh, uh, of describing it, which she does with a whole lot of conviction. Okay, all right. So um, before, can I ask you what happens before we join this story? So you're a palliative nurse um and and you've had a recent conversion a recent conversion to to faith tell us what you can about that yeah you start to find out that her conversion is is recent um but what you start to discover is that she used to kind of work in a hospital and um that was kind of something happened there many things happened there and that's kind of meant that she's now lives quite a lonely solitary life that's kind of inflicted by her surroundings and herself so can i ask you because obviously we don't want to give anything away uh, because the best way to experience this movie is just to turn up uh, and watch it but and and also i have to say it's incredibly short i think it's the shortest film i've seen this year and a lesson for many filmmakers about what you can achieve uh, in 84 minutes um wh what what's going on in in Maud's head as far as you can tell us um I feel that Maud is just and this is kind of where I felt that oh I understand that is that she's desperately trying to kind of do do the right thing and be right and not be in trouble and pursuing that without looking at anything else is kind of terrifying um, but I feel that she's kind of desperate for some sense of purpose. Is kind of living in this very individualistic world where she doesn't, she isn't part of any community. So she becomes kind of totally obsessed with her own mission. And she's a very, certainly to start with, she's a very graceful, elegant character, um, I think. And, and she is very religious. We just heard the clip where she's uh, praying with a man, Jennifer, uh, Ely character. The film suggests that her religious experiences are, uh, are real. Would that be right? Mm. Well, this is what I get in trouble for talking about ambiguous stuff with the film, <laughs> which I, <laughs> they've tried to train me about, so I, I feel unsafe to answer that. Um, but, um, yes. I, I don't know. <laughs> panic, panic. So, so okay, why are you panicking? What's what's the problem? I'm just I, I'm just in, intrigued that the you know her religious experiences. I mean, maybe she's imagining them, but to to me, watching the film, they appeared to be real. Well, to me, playing Maud, they were definitely real. But I just think that I'm someone who's watched horror and been like, I need to find exactly what happens and don't relish the ambiguity. Where that's not how lots of horror fans enjoy horror. So I'm trying to not do that. But um. In terms of filming Maud's, like the the film that you see is exactly what Maud experiences in my mind as I was doing it. Yeah. 
Morvis, let, let me ask you something about, you know, you mentioned, you said in terms of horror films, and I know that when the film first played at a, at a film festival, it was a midnight screening, and you had said that one of the things that was, that was great about it was seeing an audience being scared of you. But I think one of the most intriguing things about the film is whether or not it actually is a horror film, because yeah. there are things in it that are scary. And I've seen it three times now, and every time I've seen it, I've been scared by a different moment. But I do think that it is primarily very, very sad. I, that's definitely how I read it. And when we were filming, I never kind of felt that we were filming a horror film. And I think that's also particularly because lots of the kind of horror aspects definitely come from the music and kind of effects and stuff like that. But I, I read this as kind of, it like seemed like a tragedy of the time instead of something else to me. And when you were talking to Rose Glass, the writer director about it, how did, I mean, did she, because so much of the film is, it, it's looking at her experience of the world and then the outer experience of the world and you're sort of shifting between the two. How did she talk to you about the character? How did she describe Maud to you? We spoke a lot about just times in our own lives where you kind of, have desperately tried to do something right and it's just gone terribly wrong and also being misunderstood. Um, but kind of luckily, I think I hopefully can tell when I'm misunderstood. What's so tragic about Maud is that she doesn't. She's kind of like, my point has come across, that's brilliant. Okay, great, onwards. And um, yeah, it was kind of living in a world where you semi know the rules. You think you know the rules, but actually everyone else is playing slightly differently. Um, and also I was talking a lot about kind of why she kind of found God and what had happened previously. And what we settled on really was that she just felt so guilty because of the kind of constraints of working in a system that is underfunded and therefore people suffer kind of who are within it and who are working for it, despite how brilliant the NHS is. And obviously, a, a, lot, a lot of the film is about, is about her state of mind, but there is also a kind of great physical demand to the role. There are a couple of sequences in which you have to do things that I think are physically very complicated. Some of them we see, you know, in the trailer. Um, tell me about doing some of those sequences, like the writhing sequence or the, you know, the sequence in which she almost appears to be levitating. Um. I found those days quite relaxing because I always worry about anything with lines. So to be honest, there was kind of something quite chilled about not having to kind of, yeah, just go wild really. Also, um, because we, we have a very small budget and kind of no one knew exactly how they were going to do it. There was lots of people off screen doing incredibly physical things to make that possible. So I didn't feel alone. Um, <laughs> I would, I would just like to, uh, to compliment whoever was responsible for the sound design. I'm, ju I'm just looking it up here um, because there is a sequence, and I think I can talk about this without giving anything away, because all you're doing is cutting paper. You've got a large pair of scissors and you're cutting paper, or maybe it's card, but, it's, but the sound of it is absolutely terrifying. And uh, it's so this isn't a question this is just an observation that whoever did yeah. your sound whoever did the sound design has done a fantastic job well that was was such a treat kind of seeing it in the cinema obviously seeing all I, I'm kind of quite ignorant about lots of stuff that's going on around me when I'm filming and then obviously going in and the sound design is so wonderful and so is the music kind of the film was made by that really I'd can i just chuck it can i just chuck in here the sound design is by paul davis who i had uh, i'd mentioned in my review before and he's a, a very very fine uh, sound designer and sound editor and i think it, it is really important to flag up his contribution to the film so when, 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 well, sorry, when, Morgan, oh, sorry go ahead we kind of look really lucky with this film like paul has done loads of amazing projects and then you had the music which was done by someone who was their first job and so we had this lovely mixture that was the same on set of people who kind of were very established and comfortable with their role and kind of newbies needing yeah. to be nurtured and guided and that's lovely. Well that score by uh, Adam Janota Bajowski um, I, I think is really remarkable in fact funny enough Simon and I were talking earlier on and saying if you took the score out of the film 
it would almost not be a horror film at all because right. a lot of the time the the terror is coming from that score from that incredible score that he's that he's written mm. yeah definitely um Where, when that's you what were, makes what, it sorry. cinema i'd say <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sorry, apologies. I'm in London, Mark's in Hampshire, you're in New Zealand. So there you go. I think people will, uh, w w uh, you know, will definitely uh, understand that. When you went to see it then, Morbid, when you s sat and you watched the finished movie, did it scare you? Were you, were there any moments in it where you just were creeped out? No, I just feel so sad for it. There's so many moments in the film and I'm like, maybe if that bit was different, then like there's so there's bits every, the, the few times that I've watched it there's a different tipping point for me where I just wish it went differently but also the first time I watched it was with my sister in Toronto and she knew where all the jump scares were coming and kept on like pant kept on hiding her eyes beforehand and I was like you can't do that you're ruining the film everyone can see you um but yeah I just I still think about Maud a lot and particularly at this time and wish I could just tuck her into bed and give her a cup of tea maybe get her a pet dog who knows what difference it would have made? Well, um, we learn. We one of the things we we, we learn in the movies that God is Welsh. I'm not going to say anything else, but uh, but that was uh, a fine a fine moment. And did the character that you portrayed in your audition change much from the from the uh, the Maud that we're seeing on the screen? I don't think it did actually. I think the script. I could see her so clearly from when I read the script. I also think that. I, it's a type of person that I've kind of thought about a lot because I think maybe me and my family have aspects of kind of not being amazing socially. And so I found her very interesting and thought I could kind of, and wanted to play a character like that. Um, I would say that what changed a lot was the character of Amanda. And then that obviously affected Maud like however Amanda was played and portrayed. So just to be clear, Amanda, this is the Jennifer Lee character. She and she's the person that you're trying to trying to save. Yeah, who was originally written as a lot older and and British, and um, which was quite a different dynamic to the one with Jennifer. Rose Glass said that one of the reasons that she thought that you were perfect for the role is that you you you, you had a sense of humour. And and it's funny because when you see Saint Maud, you d you d I don't think of it as a you know as a funny or comic film at all. But she said that you found things in that character because you have you know comic experience. Do you, do you what did she mean by that? Um, I I think that <laughs> my dad's going to hate this, but my dad, whenever he's trying to be serious or kind of whenever I've seen him in like very tense situations, I find him hilarious. <laughs> I feel that it's <laughs> the opposite to what he wants to achieve happens. And I feel that a lot with Maud. I kind of, I find conviction both terrifying, I find it terrifying and very funny. And I think that I kind of, I, I feel that misunderstand the misunderstandings that happen in the film until the consequences have happened are just kind of people being a bit dweeby and not getting it. And so kind of, if I looked at it individually, little scenes with Maud, I found her really funny. And then by the end, I was like, no, oh no, consequences. And, and what do you make of the reaction to the film? Because I mean, I saw, I saw it many months ago now, actually before you know lockdown happened. It was one of the last screenings I went to uh, in London before lockdown happened. And I knew that people liked it. Um, and I knew that it had been well received, but the response over here has been astonishing. We've had letters, you know, emails from listeners who've been to see it. The reviews have been really outstanding. And people are now talking in terms of fairly major awards consideration. How do you th think about the reaction? Did you know it was going to go down this well? And do you care about the awards buzz? Um, I really can't believe it. And I think particularly because I'm here, it kind of very much seems like it's some fever dream that hasn't really happened it's it's really bizarre and I'm, I'm when I was doing it I just really hoped that some people would see it because it was kind of about stuff that I was passionate about and I thought that Rose had written something brilliant so it's it's very it's very it's a big surprise and a big shock but also kind of when I think about the film that Rose has written I'm like yay excellent thanks yeah. like 
yeah. So I'm getting all tongue-tied talking about it because it's all right. real. Um, in terms of awards and stuff, that's just something that I can't even fathom being a reality. And yeah, who knows? Well, just just finally, and, and we appreciate you talking to us because, as you said earlier, it's very early uh, in the morning uh, with you. You've mentioned a few times where you are, and we established at the beginning of our conversation that, that you're in New Zealand. Life must feel very strange there. I mean, I know you're involved in, you know, you're making this Lord of the Rings thing, which you, you know, which you mentioned, but just life in general is much more normal, isn't it, in New Zealand? It must feel really a strange place to be knowing what's happening back home. Yeah, it's strange knowing that here is more familiar than home in a way, because life is kind of going on as usual, but it's, um, I just, when I see how things are done here, I just wish everyone was here. And yeah, it's homesickness is definitely very strong, but also kind of, yeah, it's odd. And I just think about Maud a lot really in this time. Yeah. Well, um, Congratulations! It's just it, you know it's it's a huge hit, and I think people are going to be asking you about this movie for a long time because it it feel, a number of our correspondents have been saying you know this is this is a film that will stand the test of time. Uh, Morvith Clark, thank you so much uh, for joining us from the whichever roundabout it is that you're standing <laughs> next to on the North Island. There, thank you very much.